Hello artists, take two. We're gonna do this again and hopefully with sound this time. Okay, so I just wanted to go over with you some basic watercolor techniques so that you can have these in your repertoire and play around with them a little bit and have some fun with watercolor painting. So today we're going to be using two different brushes, a round and a flat, both are a size 14. We're using these because they're really great versatile brushes for watercolor or acrylic painting. You can get a lot of variety in the types of marks and paint application. When you use these two brushes, they'll kind of meet all of your needs. Um, so we'll use those today. I'm going to start off actually with the flat brush and uh, just with a very light watered down pigment, super transparent. I like to use blue usually when I do any kind of uh, preliminary uh, layout on my paintings, especially with watercolor, just because I find it's fairly cool and it doesn't interfere then with any uh, overpainting that I do after the fact. So I'm just gonna be dividing my page into six squares and no need for precision here. Um, we're just loosely creating six panels, if you can see that, and it's fairly light as well. Um, another good reason for that is because you don't want your paints to run into each other um, or the color to start to lift if you rewater something. Sometimes, especially say with a black line, uh, if you put water on it again when you're painting near it with another color, it will possibly start to mix and create a shade that you were not wanting in the first place. Okay, so first technique, doesn't matter where we start, we're going to, with a clean paintbrush, lay in a lot of water filling in our space, just getting the page nice and wet. This is the wet and wet technique. So we start off with wet page and you want to work fairly quickly. As you master this technique, you can actually lay your water in in certain shapes to fill and add dynamic shapes to your composition. So we've got our water in. Now I'm going to go ahead and add in some pigment. Uh, so I've just put a little bit of a Prussian blue on my brush here and you can see what happens as I drop it into my water. It starts to actually feather out. Let's see if we can zoom this in a little for you here. Uh, uh, no, okay. Zoom control, defunct. So I can go ahead and lay some color in. You can see it's kind of feathering out. And I'm going to try another shade of blue. Ooh, that one really, really kind of went out. You can really see it there. And so the wet and wet technique is nice for creating soft, feathery kind of textures. You can put colors near each other and let the water mix them for you, which can create really nice effects like you will find sometimes in nature when say a plant is transitioning color or an animal coat has several colors in it you can sort of show that side by side color and let the water mix them together it creates nice soft feathery kind of textures as you can see uh, lots of fun for playing around with as well. Creates kind of a bright, almost tie-dye sort of look. Just for patterning, can be fun to play with as well. Sometimes you can get things to really bleed out if you take and just go in with a nice clean brush again and drop a bit of water into areas that you've already colored. The water again will sort of push the paint out and create more of a starburst effect. Just trying to see if that's showing up on the camera. Come on. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so that's the wet and wet technique. Again, creates a soft feathery kind of effect. 
Next one that we're going to do is called dry brush. So again, I want to clean my brush, make sure I've got no residual paint hanging out in there. Now I'm not actually going to completely dry off my paintbrush. And just a reminder, you don't want to use paper towels or anything like that. Kleenexes on your bristles. The glues and fibers in there can actually damage the shape of your bristles. So if you're wanting to dry your brush, uh, you can just sort of squeeze it out into your water jar and or some artists like to sort of do a little flicking. I recommend towards the floor, not at people around you, of course. And now my bristles are lightly damp. They are moist, if you will, but they are not um, by any means wet. So now I can go ahead over to my paint tray and grab a little bit of pigment and I'm just going to work my bristles back and forth across the pan of paint. I don't want to pick up a lot of paint or moisture and you may notice as well when you do this that your bristles start to sort of space themselves out a little bit um, and divide up a little bit and that's just going to add more to the dry brush effect that we're going to do. So when you start to lightly drag your brush across the surface it creates this highly textured effect because the bristles are dry and this is nice for, again, depending on what kind of painting you're doing, uh, fur, hair, wood grain, lots of nice texture. You can also use this effect to layer colors and create more depth and dimension in your work. So I've got a little bit of brown there. Um, let's see, what could we add to that? I apologize for the snuffly sounds. I have a little bit of a cold coming on. So I can lay a little bit of orange over that and still the texture of the brown is showing through and I'm still getting that nice kind of rough surface look. So you can see the potential with dry brush to really create a lot of dimension and texture in your work, whatever you happen to be doing. So that's dry brush. Next, we're going to do what's called a wash. Um, and it's a fairly basic technique, one that you'll use a lot. Um, so what you want to do here is uh, get a lot of your color prepared before you start. When you're doing a wash, often you'll be covering a really large surface area on your canvas or your watercolor paper, and you don't want to run out partway through and have to remix and have things dry, and then you get uh, surface textures that you're not wanting. So you really want to prepare before you do a wash with a lot of your paint. So right now, in my paint well, I'm going to deposit a lot of water and I'm going to use my bigger brush because that makes more sense, doesn't it? <laughs> and um, so you get lots of water there and then start to deposit in your color and uh, pick a color, any color. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Okay, so we're going to go with blue-green um, and I'm going to start depositing that in my water. Now that's a very, very pale. I need to get a lot of pigment. So you may have to sort of work back and forth between your pan and your mixing area. Uh, please note, you should not be painting out of your actual paint pans. You should always be painting out of your mixing tray, if, especially with the semi-moist ones. If you get them too wet and leave them too wet for too long, your paints won't last very long. They'll start to deteriorate. You'll actually end up using more of your watercolor paint than you need to. The idea of watercolor is that it's very light and transparent. It's not meant to be used like, say, acrylic paint, wall paint, fence paint, that sort of thing, where you're trying to create a thick layer. It's very thin and watery. Okay, so I have a lot of nice paint here. Now I can go ahead and get ready. I'm going to do my wash in this square here. And the idea with a wash is that you're covering a large area all at once, quickly, with an even color. So that's why you have to have a lot of your paint prepared. You keep your brush wet and you lay in the color quickly. If it starts to dry in one area, 
before you get your color in. You'll get streaking, you'll get variances in the opacity of the color. It might look darker, it might look lighter, especially if you have to go back because you've run out of your color and you try to mix again. So that's why I said you want to get a lot of your color prepared in advance. So when you do your wash, you've got everything you need ready to go. This is a fairly small area that I'm doing my wash in. If I was working on a large landscape piece and trying to do a wash in a whole large sky area, I would probably actually use maybe a one and a half or a two inch flat brush, even larger sometimes, and lay in that sky area with a lot of pre-prepared paint. You can see it's still wet and I'm just sort of pushing it around the water wants to pool a little bit in certain areas. Uh, part of that as well is because of the curvature of the paper that's happening right now. Normally when you're working with watercolor, if you're working on a final piece, um, not a sample card like this, final piece, you would actually tape your watercolor paper to a board that you would be working on and you would possibly even pre-prepare your watercolor paper by giving it a light wash of clean water first um, sort of to size the paper or to prepare it for you to paint on so that you don't get the ripples and bubbles that often happen when paper starts to get wet, right? Uh, I used to call this giving it a bath to wake it up and get ready to paint, um, but anyway. so. There we go. We've got a wash. Nice, beautiful turquoise color. Nice and even everywhere there. Fantastic. Yes. Okay. Next technique that we're going to do, uh, we need some tools. So, this is all. Um, often in class, when I do this demo, we use scissors. It is actually preferential to use an X-Acto knife. <clears throat> you can use any kind of sharp object. Um, I even mention you can use a, an unfolded paper clip or something like that. But the idea here is that you're wanting to create uh, a light surface scratch on your paper. So you can take your scissors and just use them like this. Use one of the pointed blades and create light surface scratch. You're not trying to do this really roughly. Uh, if you press too hard, what will happen, and it happens more often with dull blades, um, is you'll actually start to rip the surface of the page. That's not the intention here. The idea is that you're creating small scratches or grooves, um, sort of what scoring means. Okay, so the scissors often tend to do that sort of creating rips on the surface. That's why the X-Acto is the better tool if you have one. Um, you do have to, of course, have a nice sharp blade in your X-Acto so that you get nice clean lines. Uh, just while we're talking about the X-Acto knife, could I please just take a moment? Little pet peeve when students are using X-Acto knives and not using them correctly. They push the blade out really far. These little seams that you find in the blade of an X-Acto are actually so that you can refresh your blade and have a fresh blade every time it starts to get dull. Uh, so you actually refresh that by pushing it out to the first one and snapping very carefully with safety goggles on uh, the blade off so then you have a fresh blade. So you should never push your blade out past any of those seams. There is a possibility while you're working your blade could uh, detach itself in the air, uh, fly off and, and hit you and hurt you in some way. So you should never have your blade out past any of those seams. Usually most exacto blades as well of this variety uh, will have a little lock and it's a good idea to have that as well so your blade is locked in place and it doesn't start to slide out on you. Okay, back to the task at hand. You know me, always getting off on a tangent. Okay, so we've got lots of scratches there. Let's get some paint on here. Pick a color, any color. Yep, that's what I thought you said too. I agree. That's a great color. Here we go. So now, when I start to paint over the surface where I have laid my scoring, you can see that the areas where I have scored, the paper is open and so the color goes in and it appears darker in those areas. So this is really nice if there is fine line detail work that you need to do in an area. Uh, maybe it's patterning lines or 
fine hairlines that you need to put on whatever your subject matter is that you're painting. Scoring can be a really nice way to achieve that. Uh, notice, if you can, without the glare, the areas where the scissors ripped the surface of the paper as opposed to just cutting a line in it. And that's where you've got sort of these lumpy pieces coming out because the surface was actually ripped. So I do recommend, if you can, use an X-Acto for the sharp blade effect. You'll get a more precise line, unless you want the lumpy textural look. Also an option, right? Okay, last technique. <clears throat> for this one, we're going to need puddles of paint, I like to call it, okay? So, I'm going to go ahead and use up some of my colors that I had pre-mixed from before. And we want to work wet, and we kind of want puddles to form. And our special secret ingredient that we're using here for this particular technique is something I had to pop on down to hospitality to borrow. Um, we're using salt, okay? So, uh, just a note, it does need to be the coarse kind of salt. It can't be um, just your regular small grain shaker salt. You need to get coarse salt or uh, like the big pickling crystal sort of salt because we need the crystal structure of the salt to be present for this technique to work. So we're going to take and drop our salt into the puddles and we probably will start to see is the salt actually starts to soak up the paint. The crystal structure takes that liquid and starts to pull it into the crystals. They soak it up. Mmm, salty. I assorted my painting this morning. All right. Obviously we have to work on a flat surface when we're doing this. I'm just working on my desktop here. And now we need to let that completely dry before we can remove our salt crystals. When it's completely dry and we remove them, what we'll see underneath is the sort of crystal star-like shape that happens when the salt absorbs some of that paint. It leaves behind these really interesting star-like structures. Okay, here, I'll show you this one I did before. Just gonna make a little mess with the salt. Come on, out of focus. So what happens is it leaves behind these little star-like structures. They're really kind of an interesting pattern. You could actually use them like in a landscape or something for, say, stars in the sky, um, interesting texture on fabric. Uh, I've seen some students use this just sort of as a decoration in the, in the background behind portraiture and other compositions that they've created. So it is a fun technique. It is kind of a specialty technique, something that maybe you're not going to use that often or every day, but it's fun to play around with and learn what exactly you can do with it. There is a six square here, um, and the final technique that we're going to take a look at is uh, something called a resist, and this technique <clears throat> is... Where's my pose button? Okay, and so the last technique here that we're going to take a look at um, we didn't do this one, we ran out of time in class, and it's a technique again that's sort of a, a specialty te technique, kind of like the salting, that you're not going to use every day perhaps, um, but it's still worth mentioning, and there's a few different ways to do it. Uh, it's called resist, and this technique is based on the idea of oil and water don't mix. Um, so you, before you paint an area, you lay in a resist, something that will repel the water to keep the area as is so when you paint over top of it that area doesn't get touched. There's a few different ways you can do this. I'm going to try using um, the magical mystical unicorn of a white crayon 
Um, and I say that because they always seem to be the first one that gets used up or disappears. You can also use just a plain uh, white or clear candle because it's waxy as well. Um, and when you're working with watercolor as a professional watercolorist, um, often you'll use a special resist fluid, a masking fluid, like mask to cover, um, or even sometimes rubber cement. Rubber cement though, just be cautioned, it's extremely um, fume, fumey and, and very toxic, so you can't use that in a, in a closed environment. Um, you have to be really careful with it. So, sort of like scoring, I can't really see exactly what I'm doing here, um, so I have to have it visualized in my mind. Uh, I'm going to lay in some kind of a shape here with my white crayon, just to cover my page. And again, these techniques using the crayon and the candle don't work as well as when you use the actual specific masking fluid. Um, you would paint that on, you can be much more precise, and it creates a nice clear, solid area. Um, and then there's a special eraser that you get that pulls it off after. When you put the crayon or the, the candle resist down, it's not as effective. Um, but hopefully we'll get the idea here. So now I'm going to go ahead and just paint, do a bit of a wash over top, and so you can see right away where I laid in that white crayon, the water is kind of beating up because the crayon is waxy, it doesn't like that, it's like, no, get me away from this waxy business! Um, <laughs> and so you can see I just sort of drew a little bit of a heart, and if I wanted to I could go ahead now with my painting cloth and dry up a little bit of the paint that's on top of the wax. So again, this is something that you could use. Mask out an area that you want to leave uh, as white, or you could lay a wash down, mask it, do another wash on top, then the underneath color would show through. Uh, when you're working with the actual masking fluid, you can mask out a certain section of your painting, create your wet and wet washes over top, and then, like I say, you use the special eraser and you sort of peel it off, and then it reveals a new area in your painting where you can go ahead and work in other colors. Uh, artists will do this a lot with landscape. They will mask out their cloud areas, wash in their blue sky, and then go back in and start to paint in details in their cloud colors. So there's the um, mask technique using just a simple white crayon. This is a unicorn, I tell you. This is the only white crayon in the entire school. Okay, I just wanted to show you one more that you can kind of play around with that's fun with the resist idea. And I'm going to use my square over here from Tutorial 1.0. So you can literally use masking tape to mask, right? Sound good? So get some pieces. I'm just going to lay down some random bits. This is actually one of those rolls of masking tape that's super frustrating, where you can never quite get a perfect piece of tape off. It always rips into a weird shape, which is great for this activity. Okay, so got some some nice business there. I'm gonna go ahead and lay some water in over top. And throw some colors on there. Ooh, nice purple. Violet, very nice. And let's see, make it a little more interesting. You can see how the, the paint is kind of beating up on the tape even, just like it did on the candle, or the crayon. I'm going to do a little wet and wet here, mixing my, my teal, my nice dark teal, with my purple and then you go ahead and you let that dry and when you pull up your paint or you pull up your tape after this area will be nice and white. I'll show you that what it looks like. We'll do a little magical fast forwarding here. Now that it's all dry we go ahead and start to pull up our tape and 
got to be careful not to pull up the paper with it. It is a little difficult. You can buy special low tack tape, um, which means low stickiness or not that sticky. It's great for watercolor masking areas out like this. Um, another little trick that you can do is use regular masking tape and before you lay it down just sort of um, rub it on your clothes to uh, add some fuzzies to it and make it not be as sticky. So now you can see as we pull our tape off the areas that were taped out are still nice and white and the area that we painted over top looks nice and vibrant. And now I could go ahead if I wanted to and paint in that area. So there you go, our techniques today that we did. Wet and wet, dry brush, wash, scoring, salting, and resist. So these are your six basic techniques that we talk about for playing around with watercolors. Make sure, of course, when you're done, clean out your brushes, clean up your water jar, put everything back in the cupboard, and I hope you enjoyed. Have a great day. Ciao!